Hello. Here's my homily for the 13th Sunday in Ordinary Time. That's Sunday the 27th of June. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I've been having a discussion online with an atheist recently, and what I failed to get over to him was the idea that, strictly speaking, God does not exist. God is existence. It is, of course, convenient to think of God as a person, a power, in the universe that we can talk about. Or he might talk about anything from microbes to black holes in terms of how we can analyse and understand what we're describing. Indeed, we Christians go further and talk about God in personal terms as like a father or like a friend. And we do that largely because Jesus taught us to, to relate to God in that way. So different from the God of most other religions who's only thought of as either one who is very distant and powerful and majestic or as many powers who are fickle creatures who might help us when they feel like it. What I was trying to get over to my atheist friend was that anything we say about God has to be said, said as a metaphor precisely because we're using worldly terms about a power that is, as we say, not of this world or more precisely not of this universe. But I failed to convince him it was worth relating to a power like this, because for him, unless he could use earthly terms, what we might call in the universe terms, in an ordinary way to describe God, then the God idea has for him no meaning. Our first reading today from Wisdom comes from a time, perhaps about 200 years before Jesus, when Jewish thinkers were rejecting some of the more primitive earthly descriptions of God from the earlier books of the Old Testament. In the older books, as I'm sure you know, God is often described in very human terms as a fearsome power that can hurt as well as heal, who has emotions of jealousy and anger as well as of love and compassion. But in this book, God is described as wisdom. And we hear very clearly the same rejection of wrong views of God as we find in the teaching of Jesus. The very idea that God sometimes wills suffering and death that we sadly hear from some Christians who misread the Bible is here, as in the teaching of Jesus, declared as quite wrong. Death was not God's doing. He takes no pleasure in the extinction of the living. This, of course, is what Jesus teaches, that God is the power of life and love, not of darkness or death. Indeed, it is this teaching that horrified the religious authorities of his time, because, despite the ideas expressed in the Book of Wisdom, they preferred to promote the idea of a scary God. Why? because it's a good way of keeping people under control. And sadly, many so-called Christians down the ages have also preferred to promote this scary God and ignored the teaching of Jesus for much the same reasons. Mind you, Jesus does warn of the possibility of judgment and death, but always offers the way of life. People only have to accept him and be drawn into union with him and thus with God. God's will is for us to be good in response to his love, not out of fear of hell. Today, in our second reading from the second letter to the Corinthians, St Paul is trying to persuade the Christians in Corinth to be good and kind. He has in mind the specific problem of persuading them to help the starving Christians in Judea and Jerusalem. He could have warned them that if they did not show kindness and generosity in this way, they were heading for hell. But instead, he encourages them to imitate God's love. He writes, remember how generous the Lord Jesus was. He was rich, but he became poor for your sake to make you rich out of his poverty. And when he does this, he's not just referring to the ways Jesus brought healing and life to various people, 
as we hear in today's Gospel from Mark chapter 5. But he's talking much more about the way God humbles himself, empties himself, empties himself of his power, focuses his outside the universe presence into an inside the universe presence by becoming the man Jesus. And he expresses this best of all in his famous letter to the Philippians. He writes, Have this mind among yourselves, which was in Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. I always get irritated by people who say that they think they can do whatever they like as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. Of course, what's wrong with that attitude is first that one can never tell what actions we take may hurt someone else without us realising it. But the Christian would oppose this view for very different reasons. We would say that our task as human beings is not just to avoid evil, but to be actively good and kind for its own sake, to be prepared to leave our own safe little world to help others, whatever the cost. The person who seeks simply to avoid hurting others has missed the point. To be fully human is to be like Jesus, to be like God, to be prepared to put on one side our own desires and our own safety for the sake of others. Now, luckily, most people know this instinctively, which is why, if they become parents, they're prepared to give themselves in an amazingly sacrificial way for the baby they've produced. And they know this instinctively because they are made in God's image. And so, despite our tendency to selfishness, there is deep within us a reflection of the life-giving force, the love-giving force that is God. To me, this is the most important truth of all. And there it is in our first reading, God made man in the image of his own nature. We humans are fallen creatures who are often selfish or cruel. But this, but, and this is a very big but, deep down, so we Christians believe, we are fundamentally good. It's a truth expressed right at the beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. One of our major tasks as Christians is to proclaim this truth, to help men and women to see what they really can be expressed for us supremely by the image of the man Jesus suffering and dying on the cross. There we see both the sacrificial love of God in being prepared to become a being with existence in our world, in our universe, but also a love that is prepared to take the lowest place of all for us, where his power of life and love confronts suffering and death and appears to lose the battle. We know otherwise, of course, and it's the same for us too when we suffer in love for others. For as Jesus says, whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake, he will save it. So may God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.